engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. It is nine after the hour. I am Eric Erickson. This is Atlanta's Evening News, and we have big, big local Georgia news that we've got to get to right out of the gate today. The President of the United States, Donald J. Trump, has endorsed Brian Kemp for governor in Georgia. The headline could be Trump Trump's deal in Georgia. I think this matters. It is late in the game. There is a problem for the Kegel campaign here, though. If you listen to my interview with him on Monday, you listen to him out there. They keep talking about the momentum is in their direction. They've had the NRA events. The NRA did endorse. They had gun rights events. The problem is that the polling suggests that Brian Kemp has the momentum, and he in large part has the momentum because of the Clay Tippins audio that exposed Cagle, some would say, as an opportunist, having opposed a piece of legislation, and then, in his own words, saying he had to support it this time to stop Hunter Hill's campaign from getting money, even if he thought it was terrible legislation. He's not big on school choice in Georgia, wants to support public schools. Uh, this played into a trust issue that has nagged uh, Casey Cagle among the grassroots Republicans. And, and you wouldn't know that it was a big issue outside of the grassroots, but it expanded to others because of this audio. So there's a strategic mistake now from the Cagle campaign at the end. They decided their closing salvo on Brian Kemp would be that he's not Trump, Trumpy, Trumpist enough. Um, how many Trumps could a Trump, Trump, Trump if a, could, if a Trump could Trump, Trump? Well, not Casey Cagle. Um, he essentially running an ad campaign saying Brian Kemp was supported by or supported John Kasich. That, not, he didn't actually support John Kasich, um, but that he and Kasich had cam, had a campaign event together or some such and that he was the authentic Trump guy. So for Donald Trump to come out and support Brian Kemp, eh, that's a big red flag that actually this plays back into the trust narrative with Cagle. How can you believe what he says? Um, he's been attacking Kemp as not sufficiently pro-Trump. Well, the president doesn't support anyone who's not sufficiently pro-Trump. So is he lying again? And it generates a feedback loop on the trust issue. The AJC polling shows that a number one concern for voters on is trust. And of the voters who that is their top concern, they're going to Brian Kemp. And this just reinforces that they've made the right decision. Now, on the other side of this, there's polling now that suggests that people who are going to Kegel are worried about losing to Stacey Abrams. And if you're really worried about losing to Stacey Abrams, well, you're going to go with Casey Cagle. You think he's more of a sure thing. Uh, my response to that is that Cagle thought he could easily beat Brian Kemp in the in the runoff, so he had kept attacking Clay Tippins and Hunter Hill to ensure that Brian Kemp would get into the runoff. And now it looks like he's going to lose to Brian Kemp, the, the trajectory of this race. So I, I wouldn't underestimate Brian Kemp, and the, the Abrams campaign should take note of that. All that being said, a lot of votes have already been cast. Now, most votes will be cast on Election Day, but this is going to be a close race. And in close races, early voting matters. Um, it, it, again, though, the Tippins audio about trust circulated before early voting really began. And my hunch is that of voters who were real early, you did have a good divide. Uh, you had the hardcore Kegel and the hardcore Kemp supporters going and voting early. But the trust issue manifests itself even there. Um, if the race were held today... Uh, Brian Kemp would run would win the Republican runoff, uh, but the race isn't being held today. It's being held a week from yesterday, and there's still time in a close race for things to shake up. We will see what they both campaigns come up with. There is a problem, though, for both campaigns. I guarantee you what is happening this evening, if you're hearing a scratching sound in the metro Atlanta area, now, if you're driving, you probably can't hear it because of wind noise, but if you're out walking the streets of Atlanta this evening, if you're in office buildings around downtown Atlanta in particular this evening or in Buckhead, you may hear a scratching sound. That will be the Kegel donors writing checks to Brian Kemp because they want to make sure they get their check in the door before the runoff is over. So they don't seem as completely opportunistic as they are. Um, they, I mean, seriously, th this this will impact do uh, fundraising, but there's a problem for both campaigns. And that problem is, and it is a detriment also to me and to others in the media, is that there are fewer and fewer people watching 
uh, television broadcasts, listening to radio live. Uh, people are on Netflix. They're on satellite radio. They're listening to delayed um, audio of radio programs, uh, podcasts and whatnot, uh, things on demand, things that skip commercials. It's harder and harder to get the word out. Coupled with that, you also have the decline in local news broadcasting. Uh, it, it, the AJC still has a monumental presence in the Southeast and Atlanta. Uh, WSB Radio, the largest talk station in the country. You've got WSB TV, one of the most massive TV stations in the country. You've got several other big TV stations in Atlanta. But what about the people in Macon? Savannah, Valdosta, Columbus, Augusta, Rome, uh, you name it. How is word going to get out? Well, it's going to get out through robocalls in many cases. Uh, Governor Deal, I'm sure, will be sending out a a robocall for Casey Cagle, and I bet that Donald Trump will be recording one for Brian Kemp. In fact, I'm sure uh, Donald Trump will be doing a robocall for Brian Kemp, and they will be selectively targeting Republicans in the metro Atlanta area. Um, But how do you get the word out, and how do you sustain it? Uh, that's that's going to be one of the questions. It, but, it, you know, the the Tippins audio, particularly the first bit of the Tippins audio, it trickled out into the metro Atlanta area and it really locked hold in the media more honestly than I expected it to. And it really began to shift the race. Um the the Kemp campaign began to notice it. They began to notice the trust issue uh, trickling up in their polling. Uh, some of the outside groups that have shared their polling with me saw the same issue percolating. And uh, there was a clear momentum shift. And Cagle tried to shift the momentum back, uh, attacking Brian Kemp. You can tell that Casey Cagle's campaign polling was showing the same thing, that Brian Kemp suddenly had the momentum because the number of attacks on Kemp uh, escalated uh, pretty dramatically in the close of this campaign in a way that they didn't need to if Cagle was holding on. Uh, Cagle has been plagued for a while with the idea that he was the John Oxendine candidate in the race, uh, the guy who looked like he had everything and looked like he would be the nominee and didn't even make it into the runoff. And I think Cagle getting into the runoff and coming in first in the runoff showed that that wasn't true. But what it also seems to suggest based on the polling is that he also had a cap of support. The base of the Republican Party in Georgia um, has long distrusted Cagle, uh, because they, they kind of saw him as as just the second in command guy who was just there, and on education he has been a real leader and he's been overshadowed on that issue by the governor in the last eight years. Even though Cagle himself has been a real champion for education, uh, particularly in public education and and particularly in in helping the poor and trying to come up with programs that utilize the free market to get people out of poverty, uh, but he's been anchored among the base of the party with a, a lot of uh, this, the feeling that he's an opportunist who doesn't really, he's not as conservative as he claims to be. And the Tippins audio magnified that and shifted it from just the base into the regular Republican primary voter, but not the guy who goes to the conventions and votes in the straw polls. And to end the prime, the runoff campaign, attacking Brian Kemp for not being Trump enough and then having Trump endorse Brian Kemp uh, is a very, very heavy blow to his campaign. Can he turn it around? He absolutely can. He is a a consummate politician. He knows how to run a campaign, and he's surrounded with, with really good people who know how to run campaigns. The question, though, is, is there enough time to turn it around with early voting having begun, and now you've got fewer and fewer people plugged into the regular news cycle to see these things sink in and then see the responses sink in concurrently.
Let me take a quick time out to thank this week's sponsor, ExpressVPN. Now, you may not need a VPN. I do for my work, and I've been trying to find a good one that isn't going to break the bank. And it's sometimes very difficult, and it's hard to set up. For those of you who don't know what a VPN is, a virtual private network, uh, it lets you privately and securely use the Internet at fast speeds without being tracked by anyone. Oftentimes, you have companies that require you to have a VPN into their um, system, and you just, you, sometimes you need them so you can't be tracked. With all the news coming out about data hacks and breaches, it's hard for me not to be worried about my digital privacy. No matter what you do online, your mobile carrier, internet service providers, they're tracking you. Doesn't matter what your cable company is or your phone company, wherever you're getting your internet from, you're probably being tracked. With ExpressVPN, your internet data is encrypted. Your IP address is hidden. ExpressVPN covers less than 7 bucks a month. It's rated the number one VPN service by TechRadar and dozens of expert reviewers. It has easy-to-use apps that run seamlessly in the background of your computer, your phone, your tablet. Yes, you can use them on your phone and tablet. If you're on unsecure Wi-Fi and you want to keep hackers and spies from seeing your data, ExpressVPN is for you. Now, to take back your internet privacy today, to find out how you can get three free months, go to expressvpn.com slash Eric. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash Eric for three months free with a one-year package. Every day you use the internet without ExpressVPN, you're putting sensitive information at risk, so don't put this off. Protect your online data with ExpressVPN today. Visit expressvpn.com slash Eric to learn more. It is 26 after the hour. The phone number 404-872-0750, 1-800-WSB-TALK. To the phones we go. Joe and Ella J, Welcome. Eric, how are you doing? You're great and great. Love your show. I just wanted to ask what I think the the endorsement about Donald Trump of Brian Kemp is pretty big, and I just wanted to see what you thought about it. Absolutely, Joe. Listen, I think that the, if you look at the undecided vote, uh, part of the undecided vote in the polling from the AJC is over who really is the Trump guy. And the people who are trying to make up their mind on that aren't those who are turned off by the president. They're those who really like the president. And that's one of the reasons that Cagle has been running an ad campaign and his as his closing argument that Kemp isn't the Trump guy. Well, suddenly, um, suddenly he's the Trump guy uh, because he has the president's support. And when you have that many undecided voters all waiting to get a feel for who is the Trumpiest of the Trump candidates, well, that that shifts the race. Um, more than it already had been shifted, more likely than not. Uh, again, it's worth noting, you can you can see this for yourself. Go to the cross tabs. You can dive deep into the AJC polling and see for yourself. Um, there is an underlying lingering question among the people who are on the sidelines of which is the Trump candidate, and they want to vote for the Trump candidate. Uh, but the question becomes, and I see Democrats raising this issue, is does that hurt if Kemp does get into the general election? Does that hurt him? And I will tell you my honest, candid assessment is that it is a far nastier race in the general election if Brian Kemp is the nominee. The Democrats will go after him on voter ID, on voter fraud, on voter suppression, on being the Trumpiest Trump candidate of all. Um, and they will have a, a harder time beating Casey Cagle than Brian Kemp, um, I believe. But I still think the Republican wins in November, whether it's Kemp or, or Cagle, it's just a far nastier race if it's Brian Kemp as the nominee. But I still think the Republican wins. I mean, just look at the turnout of the primary when the Democrats were most fired up. They still couldn't top Republicans in turnout. And Donald Trump won this state in 2016. It's 39 after the hour. The phone number 404-872-0750-1800. WSB Talk to the phones, to the phones. Drew in Johns Creek. Welcome. Thank you, Eric. I, uh, I'm i a big fan, and I appreciate you taking my call. Sure. I just wanted to give some, from some uh, perspective. I, uh, you know, I wasn't too happy with how, with how you know, Casey's recording came out, and I, I you know, I, I thought that Brian... Kemp was, you know, his ads were, you know, I thought they were funny, but I just didn't think they were very classy. And, you know, with, with Trump's, uh, 
endorsement this afternoon. You know, it, it you know, I trust Trump and he's doing a great job. And, and I, you know, I'm 26 years old and I, you know, born and raised in Georgia. And I, I'm, I'm happy to say that, you know, I'm going to be voting for Kemp. I, so is the president, was his endorsement the thing that pushed you over? Or had you already made up your mind? No, he, I was on the fence and, and he, I made up my mind with his endorsement, and and, I, and honestly, I think a lot of people will. You know, it, it, so it's funny you should say this, Drew, because I I occasionally, you know, my my number one rule in life these days, and this is a life motto that that you and everyone else in the world should also embrace, is never read the comments. Um, and yes, I, I I try never to read the comments on social media, but I have seen. I have made the mistake of reading them, and I have seen the strain of of uh, strident Republican voters who, for weeks, have been asking each other, "Anybody have any idea which one will support the president the most?" And it's this back and forth I've seen across social media. A lot of them I get tagged in because many of these people don't like me, and they're saying, "Have, have I endorsed a candidate so they can vote against that person?" Um, or, or has the president supported someone? And I this has been ongoing now for the last couple of weeks. And I think it's really indicative that that Cagle's final pitch is that he's the Trumpiest Trump candidate of all. Um, and now suddenly the president's supporting his opponent. That that just gets into the feedback loop of can you trust the guy? And and I, I think there will be a lot of voters in your situation who make up their mind based on this endorsement. Yes, sir. I, I appreciate it. And uh, thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely, Drew. Thanks very much. I got to get back up to Johns Creek, by the way. I like it up there. Um, you know, as a matter of fact, Randy Pope at Perimeter Church up there was the guest pastor at my church this past Sunday, and man, I needed his sermon. I really did. Uh, I have been up. I mean, I've literally woken up almost every night in the last couple of weeks, freaked out about this uh, resurgent gathering we're doing in Austin and part of his sermon on Sunday. And it's the first time I've been able to be in church in a month because I've been traveling so much. And <laughs> there's some of you here who are probably waking up in the middle of the night anxious about stuff you can't control. I mean, it was like he had written his sermon just for me. Um, anyway, well, let's get back to the phones. Charles and Grayson, welcome. How you doing? Good. How are you? All right, man. I love your information and how um, you're just a wealth of information, man. And, and, and if I'm ever confused about something, I can listen to your show and you bring clarity to a lot of things. Well, thank you. Uh, question. Mm -hmm. Alexandra Cortez, you think she has a, a chance of winning? Oh, definitely. Her district is 75 percent Democrat. Mm. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. Listen, this is this is why. I mean, it's always funny to me, Charles, where there's kind of a if if Republicans have a big wave like they did in 2010, uh, it doesn't matter. The country's still of the left. If Donald Trump gets elected in 2016 and Republicans, it doesn't matter. The country's still of the left. Uh, one socialist candidate in one highly liberal district in New York City. Uh, beats an incumbent Democrat, and oh my God, the whole country's turned socialist. Hallelujah! Um, the the distorting effects of this are actually, I think, could potentially hurt the Democrats uh, because they're playing her up so much. I actually want to get into this. I'm glad you called, Charles, because um, it, there's actually some more sound bites from her today that are as brilliant as you might expect them to be. Four zero four eight seven two zero seven five zero one eight hundred. WSB Talk. Um, Bertie and Roswell, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me on the show. Sure. So I was listening to the caller from Johns Creek just now, and I'm totally opposite. I don't really care what Trump says. I did vote for him, and I am a Trump supporter, but I trust Governor Deals, um, his perspective, more than Trump. And well, I think that Kemp has done some w weird stuff. And <laughs> I was actually driving to the polls in Roswell to vote when I heard that Trump had supported him, but didn't. Well, it kind of kind of swayed me towards Cagle. So uh, l l you know, it's funny you should say this because I I wonder how persuasive endorsements are in general. I mean, if you look at the AJC polling, there actually is a sizable portion of undecided voters waiting to get a feel for who the most Trump candidate is, and they're going to vote for him. But I, I'm well, I mean, and I think there's some gray area, Eric, between an undecided voter and an ignorant voter. Well, you it, have to it, be careful because. You ha you have to know who you're voting for, know where he stands on things or where she stands on things. 
Well, you don't vote because somebody says, "Oh, we like him." Yes, you're, you're absolutely right. Although, you know, I, I'd be careful saying voters are. Although there are ignorant voters out there, but you know, the other thing is, um, given Republican women's dislike of the president, um, will Republican women shift towards Cagle? Because that was a factor in the sixth congressional district race. Well, uh, among... I support Trump, but I also support Cagle. Yeah. So, yeah, and like it... you said, they said too. A lot of people have already voted. So yes, yes, they have. A little late. Yep, it is. Listen, thanks very much for the phone call. We got to get out of here in one second, but before we do, I want to take Bob from Buford. If I can squeeze you in real quick, Bob. Yeah, thanks, Eric. I appreciate uh, you taking my call. I want to use Rifra as a kind of a litmus test for uh, who to vote for. And I don't think that person is Kegel because uh, Deal didn't pass Riffer when he had an option to do that. So well, it, I wondered it, if you had a feel for that. Yeah, um, I think uh, the fact that all almost all the conservatives in the legislature when Hunter Hill lost went to Kemp. And they're all the RIFRA supporters. Uh, strongly suggest they think Kemp would be the guy who would pass RIFRA uh, and not Cagle. And, you know, the, the, the Tippins audio just lingers in the back of my mind um, that in 2016 was the only time the legislature pushed through RIFRA. And that was when it was pretty clear they all knew the governor agreed to veto it, but they needed to pass it so they can claim they passed it. Uh, and that that does make me suspicious. And I, I think conservatives in the legislature have gone to Kemp because they trust him to pass RIFRA. And I think that the odds are that they're right on that point, that he would be the guy more likely to sign it. It is 56 after the hour. The phone number, 404-872-0750, 1-800-WSB-TALK. Y'all are just going to have to be patient on the phones because I have less than a minute to go. And when we come back, we've got to shift gears into national politics. Uh, there is a lot to cover today, including the Russians now saying they want us to round up and hand over some American officials in response to the indictments against uh, Russian GRU agents. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen. And Facebook is under attack by the left for not being not willing to silence white supremacists on their platform. And, of course, a lot of college kids are all upset about it. We'll get into that. And, you know, randomly, you know, those phone calls you get, hi, I'm so-and-so, and they come from what looks like your local number. When I went to Tennessee and, and put up something on social media that tagged myself as being in Tennessee, I started getting them from up there as if it was local number from there. They're following you, people. They're following me, too. Is nine after the hour. I am Eric Erickson. This is Atlanta's Evening News on WSB Radar. Clear now. For now, we may get some rain though later. The phone number here 404 872 0750 1 800 WSB Talk. Um, the Russians have decided they want us to hand over Ambassador Michael McFall for financial crimes committed in Russia. It is very clearly a response to the U.S. government indicting 12 Russians. There are other American officials uh, they won't hand it over. The, um, I can't tell you the statement from the State Department um, a spokesperson who dropped an F-bomb in making it clear that this is not going to happen. Uh, the White House has said they will consider it. They will, the White House says they will consider handing over the American ambassador to the Russians. The, the State Department uh, said no blankety-blank way will something like this happen, and it is blankety-blank ridiculous for anyone at the White House to even treat this as a serious request. Um, it's not going to happen. And the only reason I'm telling you about this is because I have a prediction. And you can hold me to it or not. For the next 48 to 72 hours, this is going to be the major story in the media. 
that the president is considering handing over an ambassador to the Russians. And it's not going to happen. And the only thing that will happen is that the left and the media will fan the flames of grievance. And then nothing will happen. And this seems to be the cycle over and over and over and over. The president said he misspoke on Monday. I realized the president's statement on Monday is consistent with all the president's prior statements, except the statements that he read off of paper. On Tuesday, he read off of paper and said he misspoke and meant to say uh, wouldn't or would instead of wouldn't. Who cares? The president of the United States is different from the president's administration. I think it's obvious at this point, and it is obvious that the administration is taking a very serious stance against Russia. And it is one thing for the president to say what he says. It is another thing to look at what the president's administration actually does. And the president's administration is not dropping the ball on Russia. Um, so I don't see why there's any need to belabor the point other than the media continues to fan the flames of grievance and the Russia conspiracy. And I, I really, I got to tell you, I, so I, I had drove back from Nashville today, was listening to various podcasts and in music. I'm trying to listen to more music now and just tune out the politics. But even on the music station, sometimes, you know, that they just can't help themselves. Uh, But uh, it's just, it's crazy to me that the media and the left immediately went to the idea that the Russians wanted to steal the election for Donald Trump. Because there's really no evidence of that. There is a lot of evidence, a great deal of evidence, and now the indictments of of over 20 people to show that the Russians interfered in the American political process. The White House agrees with this assessment. The president himself agrees with this assessment when he reads it off a piece of paper. The Republicans in the House agree with the assessment. The Republicans in the Senate agree with the assessment. Republican governors agree with the assessment. The Russians tried to interfere in the election. Where the disagreement is, is that the Russians actively tried to throw the election to Donald Trump. And as of now, there is no evidence that they tried to throw it to Donald Trump. And in fact, it plays into the Russians' hands to keep Americans divided against themselves to believe that the Russians wanted Donald Trump elected as opposed to they wanted uh, discord sown within the American political process and have Republicans and Democrats at each other's throats to be distracted enough to allow the Russians to again enhance their sphere of influence. And what they've done is masterful. It is conventional wisdom now that the Russians wanted Donald Trump elected and tried to get him elected. And there is literally no evidence of it. And yet it's what the media would have you believe. And it just, it it gives a whole lot of credence to the idea that the news media peddles resistance, fan fiction, and not truth in 21st century America. And that's unfortunate because we need a credible media uh, to hold government accountable and it's really hard to when they're obsessed with the fan fiction and not with what's actually happening. Now, I want to move on to, to Facebook. Uh, and I feel like I should give a disclosure up front. Facebook uh, is going to be one of the sponsors of the Resurgent Gathering. I have invited them uh, to come to the ga- – send a representative to the gathering and sit on stage with me and answer the questions about uh, bias against conservatives and privacy and tracking people across the internet. And, and I've got a great example to tell them that I I live in middle Georgia and very often will get those phone calls on my phone that say, hi, this is whoever, and it's a timeshare credit card opportunity or whatnot, and, and you hang up on them. And I, I, I've tried to stay on the line one time with one of those to see if it would get me through to a live operator. And I, I finally got fed up and hung up. And several friends of mine have told me, don't actually do that because you may actually be agreeing to something you don't intend to agree to. Um, so I've avoided that here on after and blocked the phone numbers. But they typically come from a phone number that looks almost like my cell phone number. 
and same area code, same three digit prefix, and it 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 comes that when the ID comes up, it it says it's coming from my area, and I occasionally will answer the phone thinking this is it's the doctor's office or it's the the exterminator or or whoever, and it's always those calls. So I hang up and I block the number, but they're always from my area, and I something happened to me today. I was in Nashville, coming home. 9.45 this morning or so, got a phone call, and it was a local Nashville, well, it was actually Columbia, Tennessee, which is uh, an exurb of Nashville. It's a little further south than Franklin, about 45 minutes to an hour south of Nashville. I thought, oh, this is probably one of the guys that I had to have a meeting with on Wednesday, and I answered the phone, and it wasn't, you know, it was one of those numbers. And the only thing that had happened is... I had put up a picture on Instagram from Franklin, Tennessee the night before. And less than 24 hours later, I'm getting a phone call from a place that's within 15 minutes of Franklin, Tennessee. And I got to think that they're they're somehow able to track through social media and have tied it to my phone number and whatnot. Uh, and there are a lot of questions about that that I want to ask the Facebook people. But the Facebook people today are under attack because Mark Zuckerberg gave an interview with Recode, uh, an online uh, publication, where he was dismissive of the idea of banning conspiracy theorists and white supremacists and whatnot from Facebook. Uh, and he posits and Facebook posits that you shouldn't ban them. You should compete with them. A free marketplace of ideas on his platform. He doesn't want to get into censorship. And the left's like, everybody agrees that white supremacy and neo-Nazis are bad. Ban them. And their position is that if they're harassing you, then they'll shut them down. But if they're just putting their stuff out there and people are, are engaging it, they're not going to ban them. And I agree with him. Uh, it, it, millennial voters in particular, polling suggests are becoming much more censorious. And that's a real problem. And it's particularly a problem for Christians in this country because Christians in this country are still holding the line on, for example, gay marriage. And it's you're already seeing the left come out and say that these people need to be censored. People who don't buy anthropomorphic uh, global warming, the, the left compares them to Holocaust deniers and wants them banned. And this only works for the left when Facebook becomes the cen- censor. It's only going to work for the left. And so people on the right are going to have their views banned. We can all agree that white supremacists have no business being on Facebook. But we should be able to agree that Facebook has no business banning them if they've become the, the, the town square and they have. I mean, that, that, that is their position. Then they should maintain the town square. And that means they stop people from harassing, but they give the neo-Nazis a path to march through and share their views, but then give us the path to march through and respond and say, these people are racist idiots and unfriend all of our friends who are liking the neo-Nazis. Win in the free marketplace of ideas. Don't censor them. Because one day you're censoring all the stuff we all agree with, but the mob will eventually come for your view too. And history shows us that tends to work for progressives, which is why they're okay with it. But the conservative mob can come for the left as well. Ash Joy Behar. She had advertisers dropping from the view because of what the the offensive things she said. I, I don't believe in this this bullying and boycotting nonsense. Uh, frankly, I've got a professional interest in this and then I'm on radio and it's only a matter of time before the left comes for me because I'm pretty explicitly open in my social conservatism and, and, and culturally conservative Christian values. They're, they're going to come for me. But it's just it, we in this country have a long history of supporting aggressively the First Amendment for everyone, even the people whose views we abhor. And Facebook has embraced that view and they should be commended for it instead of attacked for it. Uh, because otherwise, the mob will eventually come for you, too. And all views will be chased out of society, except for the most saccharine liberal views. And that would be a bad thing for the free marketplace of ideas, where we can beat the neo-Nazis in the free marketplace of ideas, not just the battlefield. But we got to be able to have those conversations. And some people don't want Facebook to allow them to take place. 
Let me take a quick time out to thank this week's sponsor, ExpressVPN. Now, you may not need a VPN. I do for my work, and I've been trying to find a good one that isn't going to break the bank. And it's sometimes very difficult, and it's hard to set up. For those of you who don't know what a VPN is, a virtual private network, uh, it lets you privately and securely use the Internet at fast speeds without being tracked by anyone. Oftentimes, you have companies that require you to have a VPN into their um, system, and you just, you, sometimes you need them so you can't be tracked. With all the news coming out about data hacks and breaches, it's hard for me not to be worried about my digital privacy. No matter what you do online, your mobile carrier, internet service providers, they're tracking you. Doesn't matter what your cable company is or your phone company, wherever you're getting your internet from, you're probably being tracked. With ExpressVPN, your internet data is encrypted. Your IP address is hidden. ExpressVPN covers less than 7 bucks a month. It's rated the number one VPN service by TechRadar and dozens of expert reviewers. It has easy-to-use apps that run seamlessly in the background of your computer, your phone, your tablet. Yes, you can use them on your phone and tablet. If you're on unsecure Wi-Fi and you want to keep hackers and spies from seeing your data, ExpressVPN is for you. Now, to take back your internet privacy today, to find out how you can get three free months, go to expressvpn.com slash Eric. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash Eric for three months free with a one-year package. Every day you use the internet without ExpressVPN, you're putting sensitive information at risk. So don't put this off. Protect your online data with ExpressVPN today. Visit expressvpn.com slash Eric to learn more. Mumford and Sons really is one of my favorite groups. Such uh, just two good albums from them. Oh, y'all pray for me. I got to take my daughter to the Taylor Swift concert in a couple of weeks. Oh, he doesn't have any taste. He doesn't have taste at all. I mean, yeah, no, no taste at all for Charlie. So we don't care what he thinks about things. Let's go back to the phones. 404-872-0750-1800. WSB Talk. Michael in Commerce. Welcome. Hey, Eric. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Yeah, not too bad. So my question was, do you think there's any way that this Mueller investigation actually ends with both sides accepting the outcome? I mean, it seems like we've gone to a, I mean, like no. we've gone to a point where, yeah, Putin would even have to come out and say, yeah, I, you know, bring the election or the Democrats would have to come out and say, yeah, this is all framed job. Yeah, there, there is no way that both sides will be able to agree on this because um, either he says Trump did it and the Republicans disagree or he clears Trump and the Democrats start attacking him for being George W. Bush's FBI director. I mean, he, he's in a no-win situation, and I think he knows it. Interestingly enough, I, I had a conversation yesterday with someone who said that he's actually moving this investigation along far faster than any other uh, independent counsel investigation. It is 39 after the hour of the phone number 404-872-0750-1800 WSB Talk. Um, if you're familiar with the game Roblox, um, if you have kids, I've got kids and one of my my youngest has played this game. Um, we actually stopped him playing it because there was an online component where you could interact with people in the community and we couldn't turn it off. So we stopped him from playing it. But I know there are... Families out there who play it, apparently some hackers inserted malicious code and a child watched as his online character was raped and killed, I believe. Definitely raped, according to the BBC earlier today. Uh, This report came out. Um, Roblox says they're fixing it or has fixed the malicious code that was inserted. Uh, But you may want to keep that under advisement. Uh, Let's go back to the phones. Bud from Kennesaw, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me on your show. Sure. Um, I, I disagree with all these people who are now against Trump or him not bringing up this thing with Putin during the news conference about the collusion. And I, I'll tell you why. Trump's not stupid. I mean, we all know that. And I, I think he did that on purpose for a reason. If you look at all the people who were against Trump, I mean, we know there's certain people that are going to be against him all the time. It doesn't matter what he does or says. They're always going to be, you know, talk bad about him. If you look at the Republicans that 
who evidently weren't thinking and just all of a sudden came out and bashed him and tried to say he's not American, he doesn't stand for America. Those people, literally what they did is they just sided with the DOJ, the FBI, and Mueller. Because I don't know how many times I saw 16 different, you know, law enforcement agencies agreed with this, 16 different. So basically what they said was, you know, we agree with it too. I don't trust the DOJ. I don't trust the FBI. I don't trust these organizations because they have clearly shown. Now, I'm talking about the upper echelon, not the, you know, the regular field people, you know, because I think they're the ones that are honest. Right. But so they basically are literally saying, yeah, we agree with Mueller. We we support the DOJ. We support because, first of all, he's not going to say, yeah, I did it. I mean, and, and trust, I guarantee Trump did not leave there without bringing it up. I mean, he's going to bring it up. It don't matter. But that's not the place and time to do it. And I think he could have did it. But he knew that if he did that, he could see who was making the comments. He basically called out these deep state actors, these Republicans. They basically said by name, this is me. I don't like you. You know, you know, I I think he systematically did that. I am really, really aggravated with the number of people I saw, even those who are Republicans who have lost their minds over this, who call the president a traitor. Um, the president of the United States is not a traitor. Um, I do yeah. think that one of the issues that has to be dealt with, though, to your point with the DOJ and the upper echelons, is that all the people in the upper echelons now, because they've all now been confirmed, are people appointed by President Trump. And if these right. are Republicans at that level who are out to get him, you know, this goes to a point that, that I actually want to talk about, Bud, is is this the party of Donald Trump? And I got to tell you, there's an I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday in Nashville who has been who's on TV fairly regularly. And he said it's still the most amazing thing that you get these Republicans who go on TV and defend the president and and will say sometimes outlandish things in defense of the president. And then they get in the green room and they call him a blankety blank idiot and whatnot. And they clearly hate the guy. And I yeah. it is the it is what one of the things that led to Donald Trump becoming the nominee and getting elected in the Republican Party is so many people who tell you one thing to your face and then lambast you and disagree with you behind the scenes. And as much as there are people who get mad at me for for saying things on the radio, I'm never going to say anything to you that I wouldn't say somewhere else. And I'm never going to say somewhere else something I wouldn't say on radio. It's the the two-facedness of Republican leaders in this country is absolutely infuriating to me. And the fact that they haven't learned their lessons uh, is is deeply infuriating. And it's frankly, it's one reason why I continue to think that the president, because the Democrats do it too, why he's going to have two terms. I I really think the president's going to get reelected in 2020. Yeah, I don't I don't see a problem with that, especially the way the election broke down with the Electoral College and all that. But, you know, people need to when he was talking about the immigrants and all that, when it first started, the people that really support him, we knew what he was saying. We knew he wasn't, a, you know, a racist against illegals and a racist against women. Talking about the criminals coming over from Mexico when, when he talked about that, when he wrote the escrow. Yeah. Look, circling back on that, though, I, I do think the president uh, – and we had a call on this yesterday as well. Um, I don't think the president – he didn't come across with the Russian media is in a strong position when he he says on Monday with Putin this didn't happen, and then on Tuesday reads a statement saying it did. It it, it makes Putin look like he's in a very strong position. Um, uh, let me just put this this way, because I realize that there is a divide, and, and there are people who, who definitely want to defend the president on what he said on Monday. I, I, I don't think he handled it well. Vladimir Putin – Donald Trump – is a real estate developer from New York City who dedicated his life to building the skyline of New York City and then developed a reality television show that made him ultra famous. Vladimir Putin is a KGB psyops commander who spent his entire life studying the American psychology and how to undermine and subvert it and has run circles around multiple American presidents. And you got to be on your absolute A game going in there and sending him mixed signals I don't think is a wise thing to do. Uh, And saying on Monday that he was okay with the Russians and Putin was great and and all that, and then on Tuesday saying, no, no, we think the Russians did do this, um, is not something I don't think you I don't think you should do that. 
uh, when you're engaging with a KGB psychological operative commander who has spent years studying Americans and how to influence and undermine Americans. Uh, people forget that Vladimir Putin was a senior KGB commander during the communist era and would really love to reassert that influence. And he's a dangerous, dangerous man. And he also understands force. He doesn't understand niceties. That's not saying let's have war. It is saying let's not back down from a fight with him. Are y'all ready for college football? I'm ready. I actually got to a hotel the other night, and there was a football game, college football game on the TV. And I looked at the lady. I said, I know it was a long drive from Atlanta to get here, but I didn't think I took me until college football season. And she said, no, she wasn't a baseball fan, so she watched college football reruns on TV until the season got here. Well, at 8 o'clock tonight, uh, Jay Black is going to have an SEC special for us, uh, get you the latest The data, you can plan your college fantasy leagues and everything else out there um, by checking out our SEC coverage that starts tonight at 8 o'clock. At 7 o'clock tonight, Mark Aram is still on vacation in some small Eastern European country, and I will be in for him, and we will not be talking politics again. Uh, In fact, I don't know. Uh, Hattie B's is open. We may talk about your favorite Atlanta restaurants that aren't chains, although Hattie B's is a chain. Uh, but I think we should talk about your, your favorite hole in the wall restaurant in Atlanta. Um, all, all, I, I've had this topic. I, I need to fill in for Aram more often, uh, because I actually do want to ask if you were King for a day, what would you do? Uh, you know, there's that billionaire who funded the proposition on the ballot in California to divide the state into three portions. And it was he funded the ad campaigns, and a whole bunch of people agreed enough to get it on the ballot in November. And the California Supreme Court today has said no, um, that they're not sure whether it is something that's appropriate for the ballot, and they want to examine the issue. So they've held it off the current ballot and may put it on a subsequent ballot. Uh, and uh, yes, there are valid actual constitutional questions on that. I did not realize that James Madison actually in um, – his papers and in the um, in the Constitutional Convention debates took the position that if a state joined the Union, that there was no way for them to then leave the Union. And his was part of the Lincoln's rationale for, for standing on the Republic, that he, he had historic precedent from Madison and the Founding Fathers. Uh, and so, yeah, there, there are issues there. Can you divide us? You can't leave the Union, but can you break up a state? And they want to examine the question. Uh, but it's funny today to see people who don't like the guy saying that they, it was good for the California Supreme Court stopping a billionaire from having his way. But it wasn't a billionaire. There were There were— Thousands and thousands of people who said they wanted this on the ballot. One man can't shape the ballot. It was thousands and thousands of Californians. It was a Democratic referendum. So anyway, not going to happen now, though. We come back, though, your favorite eats in Atlanta. 